Well, friends, thank you uh, for uh, your prayers uh, for me this past week. Uh, I had the wonderful opportunity to uh, gather with uh, other Anglican leaders and, and delegates in, in Jerusalem for uh, about seven days. Uh, it was a wonderful time, uh, a wonderful conference, um, lots of encouraging things uh, taking place uh, in the Anglican Communion. I'm told that there were 1,950 uh, clergy and, and lay delegates who were participating in this conference. And even more remarkably, uh, we were representing 50 different countries uh, throughout the world. Um, Praise God. It was, it was a wonderful time. Uh, some of you have asked me to uh, uh, summarize some of the, uh, the time there and some of the things that went on. I, I hope to put together a report uh, for you and have that available for you within the next week so that you too can celebrate some of the remarkable things that God is doing throughout the world. But one of the things that we were focusing on this past week and that I so loved and so appreciated was that there was this overwhelming, unified, consistent desire from all those who were in attendance from all of these diverse places. And the, the unified focus was one of wanting to make an impact in this world with the gospel for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It didn't matter where the speaker was from. Uh, we had brothers speaking from Nigeria and, and Rwanda and, and Croatia and, and Chile and, and England and Canada. And, 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 and to a man... The focus was on making an impact in this world with the gospel for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is a remarkable thing. And yet, of course, this is what Christ has commanded us to do as his people. Uh, he has commanded us, he's instructed us to be so distinct from the world that we would make an impact on this world. This is precisely what Jesus meant when he told his disciples that they, they were to be salt and light. Remember, Jesus said you're to be the salt of the earth. You're to be the light of the world. And what he meant by that is that they were, they were to be so distinct from the world around them, they could actually then have an impact on the world. And if you think about it, of course, darkness uh, doesn't have any impact on darkness. Right? Darkness, shining into darkness, doesn't do anything. It just creates more, more darkness. And so Jesus told his followers that they were to be light. They were to be light to this world. They were to shine into this darkness and make a difference. So it's being distinct from the world so that you can actually have a noticeable impact on the world with the gospel for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we, as we come now to the end of, of Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica, one of the things that we've repeatedly seen, particularly at the beginning of the sermon series, is just how impactful this young church in Thessalonica has been on the world and the culture around them. And as we start now to come to the end of this letter, this emphasis on impacting the world once again becomes the point of focus. So let's turn our attention there. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let me invite you to open your Bibles or your bulletins there. Uh, you have verses 12 through 22 printed in your bulletins. We're almost uh, near the end of this letter, letter now, Lord willing. We're going we're to finish it up next week. We'll look at the final verses 23 through 28 next week. But as we, as we near the end of this letter, one of the mistakes I think we might make at the end of this letter is to see all of these commands that are given us in these verses as just sort of a miscellaneous collection of teachings, you know? Uh, even if you look at it there as it's printed out for you, even just the way that it's formatted, it almost seems like these things are all separate, right? They're all given their own distinct verses. There's, there's a number of verses here, but they're all very short. Each sentence almost has its, its own verse number. It almost makes it feel like all of these things are, are just kind of disconnected thoughts, as if Paul just sort of kind, of kind of rapidly at the end of this letter had all these things that he wished he had said, and he didn't have time to say them earlier, and so he just kind of throws them out there one after the other, and you just sort of, sort of pick them up, and they're all distinct. But actually, though, uh, many of these commands, they fit together. They're, they're working together. And they particularly fit into the whole of what Paul has been doing throughout this letter. Uh, this, was, this was a young, vibrant church in Thessalonica, remember. Uh, two months ago, when I, when I preached the, the first sermon in this series, what I emphasized is that a, a profound and powerful spiritual awakening had taken place in this city. And it had radically changed the lives of many people who had come to faith in Jesus Christ. You remember that from chapter 1. Paul reminded the Thessalonians themselves. He said to them in chapter 1, verse 5, Our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Okay, that was chapter 1. That was where the letter began. 
And here now, in the final chapter, you see Paul, Paul's instructing them to continue on in the same spiritually powerful, profound way. And so one of the things he's going to say to them in some of these closing verses that we'll look at later is, is, is do not quench the Spirit. But continue on in this spiritually powerful way. Now, why does Paul come back to this emphasis? Well, again, he does so because this church was having such a wonderful impact on the world around them. And so much so, you know, that they didn't have to do any advertising. They didn't have to go out and tell people that they existed. People knew that they existed. Uh, Paul said to them in chapter 1, he said, your faith has gone forth everywhere so that we don't need to say anything. He said, I, I went out to go tell people about you, but people already knew about you. I mean, how great is that? I think we should want that for ourselves. Uh, not simply because we want to be recognized, but, but because that means that there's, there's, there's an obvious nature to our Christianity. And so again, here at the end of the letter, the essence of what Paul's telling them is to keep on being that same impactful, spiritually empowered congregation that you've been from the very beginning. Because listen, it's one thing to have an initial experience. It's one thing to have an initial outburst of the Holy Spirit, right, where, there's, where there's, there's, there's great revival and there's, there's great awakening. That, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. That's That's wonderful. But it's a much greater thing, you see, if that's ongoing. Right? It's a much greater thing to have a faithful, impactful ministry year in and year out. And that's what Paul wants for these Thessalonians. He wants them to, to continue on. He, he doesn't want this to be just a one-time thing, like a, like, like a beautiful flash of lightning that's there and then it's gone. I grew up in a part of the country where you have these amazing lightning storms. And you can see them way out on the horizon. These beautiful flashes of lightning. But they're there and then they're gone. That's not what Paul wants for them. He wants them to be like the sun, to shine ongoingly, to year in and year out, to be the Christian church in such a way that it sticks out in the world and it draws the world in. And friends, the church makes the most impact in this world when it is most distinct from this world. Because what we have to offer isn't just something slightly different or a, a different version of what the world is offering, you know, with a sort of a religious veneer to it. Now we have something that's radically different. And the church, if it's truly the church, can't help but be God's central evangelistic enterprise in this world. Right? Being distinct, showing something different, having an impact on the world, and drawing people in. So what is that distinctiveness look alike. Well, in this passage that's printed there in your bulletins in verses 12 to 22, we see the nature of the Christian church and part of what distinguishes it from the world in the way that, that three different kinds of relationships in the church are conducted. Now, you looked at two of these relationships last week, so we're going to look at one of them this week. But just to remind you, in verses 12 to 13, Paul speaks about the relationship of the church to its leaders. Then in verses 14 to 15, Paul speaks about the relationships Christians have with one another in the church. And then, and this is what we're going to focus on today, in verses 16 to 22, Paul speaks about the relationship that the church community has with God himself. Okay, so he begins by talking about the relationship of the church to its leaders. Then he goes on to talk about the relationship of Christians among themselves within a church community. And then, as what we're looking at today, he speaks about the relationship that the church community has with God himself. And the point is that when the church conducts itself in these relationships in these ways, it will distinguish itself from the world and thereby be able to have an impact on the world. And there are two points I want to make this morning under the heading of that third relationship, of what our relationship with God should look like. So let me give you these two points up front, and then we'll dig into each of them. So first, verses 16 to 18. When it comes to our relationship with God, what will distinguish us in that relationship is if we live consciously in the presence of the Father's love for us in Christ. And secondly, verses 19 to 22, when it comes to our relationship with God, what will distinguish us in that relationship is if we live intentionally in the power of the Holy Spirit who is given to us at our conversion. 
So one, live consciously in the presence of the Father's love for you in Christ. And two, live intentionally in the power of the Holy Spirit who was given to you at your conversion. And friends, if our relationship with God is marked by these two things, we will have an impact on this world. So first, we're to live consciously in the presence of the Father's love for us in Christ. Look at verses 16 to 18. Paul writes, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, I suppose I could have just named this first point, be obedient to God. You know, the, one of the things that distinguishes in our relationship with God is that we're obedient to Him. Obey God's will. And of course, we need to do that. As the Bible says, this is, this is God's will for us, and, and, and God's will needs to be obeyed. But each of these commands, you see, is actually reflective of a relationship with God. And specifically, each of these things is reflective of a life lived consciously in the presence of God's love for us in Christ. I take this first one, rejoice always. God's will for us is that we would rejoice when? When? Always. Always. Some of you will remember, I'm sure, that the founding minister of Christ Church was fond of uh, C.S. Lewis's quote where he said, I think we all sin by needlessly disobeying the apostolic injunction to rejoice as much as by anything else. To not rejoice, brothers and sisters, is to sin. Jesus' desire and prayer for us is that we would know joy. He said to His disciples in John 15, 11, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. It is a sin not to rejoice. We're commanded to rejoice. Now, of course, I think it's helpful uh, to distinguish true Christian joy from the, uh, the kind of giddy emotionalism of our culture. And so to rejoice always doesn't mean to smile always. And we also need to remember that this church to which Paul's writing is a church that was suffering terrible persecution. So much so that some in the church community there had even died. And yet, here they are being instructed to rejoice when? Always. Is Paul being insensitive here? Is he ignorant of their pain? Is he just a terrible pastor who doesn't know how to shepherd this church in Thessalonica who is grieving the loss of their loved ones? And the answer is, of course not. Because what Paul is getting at here, you see, is that the sources of rejoicing for Christians are found deep in the unchangeable love that God has for us in Christ. And Christ is our joy. When Christ was born, the angels appeared and they proclaimed that, that this, was, this was good news of great joy. And the Apostle Peter said about Christ, though you do not now see Him, you, you believe in Him and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Christ is our joy. Christian brothers and sisters, God, God has chosen you from eternity past. Is that not a remarkable thing? He has set His love on you from eternity past. And He delights in you. He rejoices over you. He, he sings over you because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Christ has, has taken your sin and Christ has given you His righteousness. And you're no longer under the judgment of God. The wrath of God has been removed from you. And even when you face death and the ugly, horrible thing that death is, at that moment when you die, you have the promise that you will enter into a state of glory and into a state of perfect holiness and that God will one day give you a resurrected body and you will be in His presence forever. God has not destined you to obtain wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us so that no matter what, we will always be with Him. That's God's love for you in Christ. And it's when we know these, these gospel truths, it's when we, we live consciously in these truths, in that love, uh, that no matter, no matter what's going on 
in our lives, no matter, no matter the persecution, no matter the sufferings, no matter the hardship, we can yet rejoice always because Christ is our joy, you see. One of the more powerful moments this past week when I was in Jerusalem uh, was when two brothers, uh, one from Nigeria and one from Burma, uh, shared some of their testimonies. Uh, both had uh, and, and continue to have and experience significant persecution. Uh, the Nigerian brother has been attacked in his home repeatedly. Uh, members of his congregation have been murdered. Uh, the brother in, in, in Burma uh, spent considerable time locked up in horrendous conditions. And as I heard them speaking, I was so convicted, especially as I was reflecting on this word that I was to preach today. I was so convicted by what they were saying. I, I, I wrote down a few of their quotes. Here's, here's a few direct quotes of things that they said. Our, our, our Nigerian brother said this. He said, I'm happy if I die with Christ because I know where I'm going to. And then he said, I enjoy suffering because I share in Christ's sufferings. Our Burmese brother said, I'm not afraid to spike guns and military because they can't kill my soul. My body will be resurrected one day because Jesus' body was resurrected. And he also said, if we stand on the Bible, our persecutions will become pleasant for us. These are, these, are, these are two brothers who have suffered immensely. And yet the attitude that characterized their relationship with God was one of joy. Christ is their joy. And so no matter the circumstances of our lives, it's God's will for us as well that, we, that as we live consciously in the presence of the love that He has for us in Christ, that we too would rejoice always. Secondly, God's will for us here is that we would also pray without ceasing. Now by that, Paul obviously doesn't mean that we, we unceasingly pray in a formal way, maybe with our, you know, our eyes closed and our heads bowed. That's, that's obviously not possible. That's not what he means. I think the idea here is that we're to, is that we're to live in prayer, you know? That, it, that as you move throughout your day, you know, when you get up in the morning and you, you do all the things that you got to do, maybe you got to get the kids ready and you, you got to get to work and you, you're on the subway and you're, 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 you're dealing with projects and, and colleagues all day and you come home and you got to make dinner and you got to do all the things you got to do to end the day and get to bed. Throughout that, you're to live in prayer. Uh, you're, you're to be in constant prayer, constantly communicating with God. Now, at the same time, that doesn't mean that we don't need to have formal, disciplined times of prayer. We do, and we, and we need to set apart part time every day for that. In fact, we need to be unceasing in that discipline where we begin every day in formal prayer. And even things like, like prayer meetings that we have at the church where we gather together specifically for formal prayer, th those things are good for us. But what the Bible is emphasizing here, I think, is that in addition to those formal set-apart times of prayer, we are to live prayerfully. That is, we're to live in the presence of God. We're to live in communion with God. And friends, this is the great distinctive characteristic of the church. The church is to be living continuously in communion with God, in whose presence we are constantly in. And the reason that we can do so and the reason why we want to do so is because we know that our Father loves us. You know, we have a Heavenly Father who loves to hear the prayers of His children, who loves to be in communion with His children. And so we live in a, in, a, in a posture of openness to God throughout our day. Now, a consequence of that is that we learn then to be thankful to God. Yeah, that's the third part of, of God's revealed will here. Verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances. I, I think you could argue, as some have done, that, that prayerfulness and thankfulness go together. And they're, they're really two sides of the same coin. That, that, that as we're in constant communication with our Heavenly Father, Right? Our gaze then is, is, is consciously fixed on Him and so, so we begin to see life from His perspective. 
We begin to see and to understand all the different ways that God could be at work in a situation. We begin to see and understand that God is working everything together for our good. We, we, we live our lives surrounded then by the, by the aura of His fatherly love and care for us and so we can give thanks in all circumstances. So rejoice always. Pray unceasingly. Give thanks in all circumstances. These are the byproducts of what it means to live consciously in the presence of the Father's love for us. And let me just give you one example from the Bible of how you see this uh, expressed and, and worked out. Uh, Psalm 100. If you have a Bible you want to look at Psalm 100, I invite you to turn there. In Psalm 100, the Psalms themselves, of course, are prayers, right? These are the prayers of God's people to their Father. It's, it's people being in communion with God and calling one another to worship and calling one another to prayer. And in Psalm 100, we have these themes wonderfully coming together. Psalm 100 reads this. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. Why do we rejoice? Why do we give thanks? Because we know that, that the Lord is God. It is He who made us. And we are His. We praise God. We can rejoice because God has created us. He's given us life. We belong to Him. We are His creation. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. So not only has God created us, but He's redeemed us. He saved us. He has brought us into relationship with Himself so that we are, we are His people now. The psalmist goes on. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. And then we're told why. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And His faithfulness to all generations. As the psalmist lives in the, the very presence of the love of God, he, he gives thanks. He sings with gladness. He rejoices at his great God. And friends, if we're those who rejoice always and, and pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstances, if, if that's what our relationship with God looks like, will that not make us distinct? Tell me of another community that looks like that. Will that not be winsome and attractive in a dark world? Now, even as I say that, I have a confession to make. I, I look at these three short commands here in verses 16 to 18, and I have to confess that my first inclination is that this is impossible. Who really lives like this? Who really rejoices always? Who really prays without ceasing? Who gives thanks in all circumstances? I mean, maybe it's just my own sinful heart. But I look at this and I don't know if I can do God's will here. I mean, my first instinct isn't to rejoice. It's to be cynical and grumpy. And so much so that my wife too often has to say to me, why are you so grumpy? I don't know, I'm just grumpy. Uh, my first instinct isn't to pray without ceasing. It's to, it's to be dismissive and, and self-reliant. My first instinct isn't to give thanks in all circumstances. It's to grumble and it is to complain. And so I look at this and I think, I don't know if I can do this. You know, even with these great gospel truths running through my mind uh, that are helping me to live consciously in the presence of the Father's love, I don't know if I can do this. This seems impossible. And in one sense, it is impossible. Right? In and of yourself, it is impossible. In and of myself, it is impossible. The natural man cannot do that. Which is why... Verse 19 is such a critical follow-up command. Do not quench the Spirit. And actually, in the original language, the Spirit is in the first position of the sentence in verse 19. And so it actually reads, the Spirit do not quench. And I make that point because as you read here about God's seemingly impossible will for you, you then immediately come to the words, the Spirit. And why is that important? Because, of course, it's the Holy Spirit who equips us and empowers us to have these attitudes and postures in our lives. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. It's the Spirit who helps us to pray in our weakness, Romans 8. It's the Spirit is the one who, who helps us to see things from, from God's perspective. He's the one who gives us the, the truth of God, John 15, so that we can then give thanks. Thanks. 
And thus supremely, it's the Spirit who opens the eyes of our hearts to really see and really believe the glories of Christ in the Gospel and to really know the love that God has for us. And so it's the Spirit who enables us to truly live consciously in the presence of the love that the Father has for us in Christ. And so Paul now logically and quite helpfully commands us, do not quench the Spirit. Or again, in the original language, the Spirit, do not quench. And that brings us to our second point. There in verses 19 to 22. If we're to have an impact on this world by being distinct from this world, then when it comes to our relationship with God, we must live intentionally in the power of the Holy Spirit who was given to us at our conversion. Look at what Paul says in verses 19 to 22. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. But test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. As many of you know, I'm sure the Holy Spirit uh, in the Bible is often associated with fire. And so the NIV actually translates verse 19 this way. It says, do not put out the Spirit's fire. And what that's pointing us to is the, is the power of the Holy Spirit who inflames us to burn hot for the glory of God in our lives. And so Paul, Paul's in, in instructing this community to, to not put out the fire of the Spirit who's come upon them. To, to, not, to not douse the, the work of the Spirit with water, but instead to, to throw more and, and more logs under the fire, as it were, so that the fire of God's Spirit burns hot in their lives, empowering them and even cleansing them as fire does. Now, if you look at verse 20, what Paul gives us in verse 20 is one specific application of how not to quench the work of the Spirit in our lives. Do not despise prophecies. Okay, so to, to despise prophecies or to, to have contempt for prophecies is to quench the work of the Spirit. Okay, that's how we put out the, the fire of the Spirit in our lives. We, we, we despise prophecies. Now, of course, the million-dollar question is, what does Paul mean by prophecy? Uh, which isn't a simple question to answer. In fact, there's lots and, and lots and lots and lots we could say about this. So let me, just, let me just try to make one critical point, maybe two, this morning. Okay, here's, here's my critical point. Part of Paul's understanding of prophecy is that it is the Word of God spoken under the inspiration of God's Spirit in such a way that it edifies the people of God and strikes home to the conscience of those who hear it. Let me say that again. There's a lot there. Part of Paul's understanding of prophecy is that it is the Word of God spoken under the inspiration of God's Spirit in such a way that it edifies the people of God and strikes home to the conscience of those who hear it. Okay, you get all of that from 1 Corinthians 14. Now what we have to remember is that these early churches, like this one in Thessalonica, didn't yet possess the New Testament like we have it today. And so what God did is He provided prophets, He provided apostles to declare God's Word to them. Now, we see in the New Testament that, that some of these prophets uh, might foretell future events. I think of someone like Agabus in, in Acts chapter 11. They would foretell future events. But their main job uh, was, we might say, to, to foretell, foretell the gospel. Okay, so not to foretell the future, but to foretell the gospel, to proclaim the gospel. That was the main job of the prophets and the apostles. So in other words, they, they were preachers of the New Testament message before that message was recorded in writing. And it's, it, it's on them and on their teaching that the foundation of the church is built, Ephesians 2.20. But of course today we, 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 we have now the New Testament written. Uh, we have the, the fullness of, of God's Word given to us here in the Bible. And because that foundation has already been laid by the apostles and the prophets, right, what that means, you see, is that nobody has the right to tamper with this word or, or to subtract from this word or, mind you, to add to this word. 
The Word of God written here is, is supreme and it is sufficient. And so the closest analogy to prophecy today is, is really something like preaching God's Word. And so to sort of fuel the flame of God's Spirit in our lives and, and, and in our churches, what that means is that we need to devote ourselves to the ministry of the Bible, both in terms of our personal reading of it and especially in terms of the preaching ministry within the church. Right? When the Word of God written is spoken in such a way so as to edify the people of God and to strike home to the conscience those who hear it, that is prophecy. And so the problem that Paul here is addressing would be that when the Word of God is spoken, I think to myself, no matter what may be going on outwardly, but I think to myself, I think in my heart, I think in my mind, you know what? I can take it or leave it. When it's being preached, when I'm reading it, and I sit over and I think, you know what? I can take it or leave it. That is to despise prophesying. And the tragic consequence of this is that the edification that's there for me in the Word of God is then never received by me. And the work and the power of the Spirit is then quenched in my life. So what are we to do instead? Well, Paul gives us the positive outworking of all of this in verses 21 to 22. We're to test everything. In other words, when we when we hear the Word of God, we're, we're to, to ask ourselves the question, how am I going to put this into operation in my life? How can I test it out for myself? And wouldn't that be something? When I come to God's Word in my reading and as I, as I hear it preached, if I kept asking myself the question, how can I put this to the test? How can I apply this to my life? How can I apply I can practice this in my life. And then as we do that work of application, we're, we're, we're to hold fast to that which is good. Which is to say we're to hold fast to that which is, is consistent with, with God's truth and God's holiness and we're to abstain from all evil. So, so don't despise the Word of God by dismissing it. But take it seriously enough to test it out in your own life. So friends, listen, what all of this means in terms of everything I'm trying to unpack here for you today is that if we're to live consciously in the presence of God's love for us in Christ, and if we're to have the byproducts of that in which our lives are marked by the distinctive features of joy and communion with God and thanksgiving, then it's going to depend on what you do with God's Spirit-inspired Word. And that is so critical for us today. Sometimes when I'm in conversations with people and they learn that I'm a pastor, they want to know what kind of church I pastor. So sometimes I get a question like this. Is your church charismatic? And I never know quite what to say to that question. Because I'm, I'm sure they have an idea of what they think charismatic means. And in one sense, maybe we don't have that mark of extraordinary enthusiasm that some would associate with charisma. But most often what I simply say is, yes, in fact, we are. We are indeed a charismatic church. Because though we don't do this perfectly, we are devoted to the Bible. We are devoted to God's Word. We strive hard to teach it faithfully. And we want to humbly sit under the Word of God so that we can fan into flame the power of the Spirit of God in our lives. We need the Word and the Spirit together. We need the Word as a means of, of bringing us into contact with the Spirit. And we need the Spirit who is the very Lord and giver of life to powerfully use that Word and apply that Word in our lives. Which, as we've seen, is exactly how this church in Thessalonica began. Right? That's what happened when they were converted. Again, chapter 1, the Word came to them. But the Word didn't simply come on its own. It came with power and with the Holy Spirit. Or remember what Paul says to them in chapter 2. He says to these Thessalonians, he says, we're so thankful to God for you because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men. You, you didn't despise it. You accepted it as, as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you, believers. Believers. 
And so Paul's now saying to them, what you need to do is to keep going on in that way that you started. Do not despise God's word, but continue to receive it as it really is, and the Spirit of God will accompany that word and work powerfully within you, and you will have an impact in this world. Sinclair Ferguson once said, if you have the word without the Spirit, you will dry up. If you have the Spirit without the word, you will blow up. But if you have the Word and the Spirit together, you will grow up. My friends, that's what we want. We want, we want to keep going. We want to keep growing so that we can impact the world around us for the sake of Christ. We, we don't want to be just sort of a one-hit wonder, you know, to have a moment of, of, of power and enthusiasm, but then we fade away. We want an ongoing, powerful presence so that we can impact the world with the gospel for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we close, two, two closing questions and reflection on what we've been looking at here today. First question, how consciously are you living in the presence of God's love for you in Christ? How consciously are you living in the presence of God's love for you in Christ? Christian brothers and sisters, do you believe that God loves you? Do you believe that He actually rejoices over you? You know, you can serve one another this week in a really helpful way. Send a text message to somebody else in the church. Just remind them, because of the Lord Jesus Christ, because what Christ has done, God loves you. And friend, if you're not a Christian here this morning, I want you to know that God loves you as well. He, he created you. Uh, you're, you're made in His image. He, he cares for you deeply. But of course, in the same way that, that a parent might love all children, but have a special love, a unique, passionate love for their own children. The same is true of God. With those who have become part of His family through the Lord Jesus Christ, He has a special, unique, passionate love for them. But the invitation is open to you to come and to join God's family through Christ. It's about turning away from yourself and putting your trust in Jesus and becoming a son or a daughter of God. And as you do that, God will pour out His, His passionate, unique love upon you. And you will know what it is to, to rejoice and to walk in communion and fellowship with this God who is alive and to give thanks in all circumstances. Second question. How intentionally are you living in the power of the Holy Spirit. How intentionally are you living in the power of the Holy Spirit? And what we've seen here, what Paul's saying is that the real question is, what are you doing with God's Word? Are you despising the Word of God, perhaps? If you tamper with His Word, you are despising it. If you try to subtract from it, you are despising it. If you try to add to it, brothers and sisters, you are despising it. The Word is supreme and it is sufficient. We're going to take the Word of God and apply it to our lives to test everything. And in all that we've been talking about here today, do you realize that if, if these things characterize you, who it is that you will look like? You will look like the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe this afternoon, go home and, and read one of the Gospels, one of the, the biographies of our Lord's life, and what you'll see is that Jesus was a man who rejoiced. Jesus was a man who prayed unceasingly. Jesus was a man who gave thanks in all circumstances. And not only that, but He was a man living consciously in the, in the love that the Father had for Him. And a man whose closest companion was the Holy Spirit. It was the Spirit who empowered and equipped Jesus every step along the way. And why? Because Jesus was a man of the Word. Over and over again you see Jesus immersed in the Scriptures of the Old Testament. And it's Jesus we want to be like, isn't it? After all, who has had a greater impact in this world? than the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your Son.
We thank you for the love that you have poured out upon us in him and through him and because of him. Father, we are so easily distracted. Keep us from despising your word here this morning. Help us to test it. Help us to apply it. That we may cling to that which is good and and turn away from all that is false. And Father, we pray that by your grace and your mercy that you you would be pleased to work through us that we might have an impact in this city for the sake of Jesus. And we ask this in his name. Amen.